we finally get to the cheese board itself. So one of the things we also take into consideration is that we use natural materials. We use wood, we use marble, eventually ceramic, glass. It's the perfect mix and match exercise. Whatever you have at home that suits the purpose is something you may use. You've even seen me use this at one point. Well, I just want to show you that this is a tile from when we were tiled at home. So even this works. What you don't want to use is plastic or metal. They are not going to do the trick. Plastic might get into your cheese when you cut it. Metal is going to transmit a bit of flavor. So avoid metal and plastic. But wood, marble, ceramic, glass, by all means. This is one thing. The other thing is that when we prepare a cheese platter, cheese goes always in odd numbers, not even. So it's going to be a three, five, seven. Normally what I do is that I count more or less one cheese for two people. And what I mean is one kind of cheese for two people, uh, considering then the different amounts. So maybe I'm going to have one camembert and uh, 250 grams of another cheese and uh, a half reblochon, which I don't have here, but I could have put, etc. Next, you want to also consider that you have your three milks, which I have. I have my goat, I have my sheep, I have my cow, and then I also have different textures and colors. So this is more or less what a cheese platter is going to look like. Then I also make sure that all my families are represented. Of course, Camembert is the symbolic French cheese. I had left it for the end. It's always on the Christmas cheese board. Also, I always try to represent different regions to make sure that I have or a cheese board that represents different areas in France in case I have friends or family that come from different places to cover as much of the territory as I can. So here I have the Loire Valley, here I have Burgundy, here I have the Loire Valley again, here I have the Basque country, here I have Normandy, here I have Alsatia, and here I have Aveyron. I've quite covered the territory. What remains to be done is to cut the cheese and different formats are cut in different ways. Once you have your natural materials, your families, your regions, your milks, everything, now what you need to do is to cut your cheese. What you want to obtain are portions that have an equivalent amount of rind and cheese so that nobody gets all the cheese while somebody else gets all the rind. The French have different kinds of knives but you can replace them and I'm going to show you a few hacks. As you see I've got lots of things around but some of the knives are particularly handy. Maybe this one for Camembert because it has this double tip here which helps then remove your slice. Actually, not only camembert, but soft cheeses in general. Or this kind of thing may be very handy to cut a cheese like Roquefort. What you actually need to obtain are geometrical shapes, so circles, triangles, rectangles, with equivalent amount of rind and cheese. For example, this one. This is my saint maur de Touraine. If you have one of these cheeses, they have this bit of hay inside to give them consistency. So before you cut your cheese, you need to remove the hay it has inside. This is the first step. Cheeses are marked on this straw here. They have a laser marking that allows you even to go back to the producer and to the number of the batch. This serves a double purpose, consistency for the cheese, and also it enables you to know who produced it and the batch number just in case. I picked a white knife because as I've been telling you today, there are different families in cheese and you don't want to cut your Roquefort with your goat's cheese knife because if not, you're going to be transmitting flavors and you're not going to be able to taste your goat's cheese. I find it an easy hack because I have this set of knives to use my white knife for the goat's cheese, no mistake possible, my orange knife for the washed rinds, no mistake possible, and my blue knife for the Roquefort or other blue cheeses, again, 
no mistake possible. So if you don't have a knife per cheese, try to have an easily identifiable knife per cheese family. What about here we are with my Conte. If you look at the shape, I have all my rind at the back here. So what I don't want is to have somebody that when this person gets here, I've only got the rind left. To cut these cheeses, you have several kinds of knives. This may be one kind. You may also cut slices with this kind of thing, like this, or eventually, again, with a standard knife. You're going to be able to cut it without much difficulty and it's not really going to transfer as much its flavor to another one. However, how do I cut this cheese? I want to obtain rectangles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start cutting rectangles in this way. Narrow rectangles like this. So each person cuts a rectangle like this and they have an equivalent amount of rind and an equivalent amount of cheese. I may eventually come up here. Now the cheese is getting rather thick. So probably this person here is going to cut this way and because this piece would be too large in half like this. And again, half a slice and half of the rind. Then I'm getting too close to the end. So I cut in triangles like if it were a fan. So like this, like this, like this, like this. It doesn't have to be identical, but the idea is everybody gets a part of cheese and a part of rind. Rectangles to start with, then eventually here in half, and then when you get to the very top, like a fan, triangles in this sense. Exactly the same thing I'm going to do with this kind of cheese. This cheese and this cheese I'm going to cut identically. Now, if I don't have one of these, you can pick this one or you can just pick this one. I told you cheese platters, if you didn't have all the equipment or a mix and match, I'm just showing you other mix and match. Wheels like this one, you start from the center and you cut it in triangles. And then with the tip of your knife, and this is where the double end of the knife comes in handy, you remove the cheese and you put it on your personal dish. Here I've cut my camembert. With small wedges like this one, one might cut slices like this, or eventually start like this, and then like this, and then like that. Because the washed rinds are rather strong, this knife is for the orange rinds. So I've made it clear that this knife is for the washed rinds. My Roquefort is another story. These are soft cheeses and they are brittle because they've been injected with a mushroom that has created even more fragility into the cheese itself. The minute you start cutting it, it's messy. You may try to use a double-edged knife. Another possibility, one of these, and then you cut with the wire. Roquefort, are generally cut in this way. You start more or less from the middle, you cut one slice here, then another slice there, and you go on like this. Now you see what I'm telling you that Roquefort is difficult to cut, mix and match, even if you need one of these, which aren't meant to be used with cheese, nothing prevents you from picking up one of these, picking up your knife, and doing something like this and then you put this bit here on your dish. My square cheeses. This is my Pont de l'Evêque, this is my Valence. Of course this is a pyramid but remember I told you that Talleyrand had cut the tip of the pyramid to avoid embarrassing Napoleon so now I have a square here. Since it's a goat's cheese I pick my goat's knife. Remember my white knife? I cut it like this and like this and then diagonally and of course I would go then to the bottom and pick up the wedges and put a wedge on my plate and I'd use the same knife for both because they both belong to the same family. Pont l'Evêque is a washed rind. I don't want to use the same knife that I'm using either for my camembert and even less for my goat's cheese. So how do I cut my square? Well, just like I did with the pyramid, even easier. Again, across and diagonally. And of course, if people don't have the same appetite, somebody might, might cut a, sli a smaller slice. But the idea is always from the border to the center. 
And now I have this one here, which is a blooming rind, again from Normandy, like the Camembert. The problem I have with this cheese is that it has a funny shape. It looks like a heart. So because it has this funny shape, your best option again is to come to the center. From the center, you cut a slice like this. Then from here, you go this way, then you pick it up this way and you put it on your plate and you get wedges that are equivalent. Always the same principle. So now we're coming to the end and I've left my brie and my mimolette. My brie comes from a wheel, so I could never ever cut my cheese like this. There are several ways to cut a brie. I'm going to show you one. There are other ways to do it. So I cut this way here. I cut it through, then eventually I cut through like this, like this, and eventually like this. Once I get to this point here, I may cut it either like this, or I might eventually create a triangle in this sense. This is my other option. I start horizontally. When I get here, I either cut it in half or a triangle, and one person gets this side and the other person gets this side. And then when I get to this part here, I do a one, two, three of sorts. There are different schools, there are different methods. I'm showing you the one I go by. Now for mimolette. This mimolette is aged, so it's going to be rather hard to cut. And imagine if instead, I know this is a French cheese platter. Imagine I had an Italian cheese board and here I had an aged Parmesan cheese. It would be even harder than my mimolette. That's what this knife, is useful for. These are actually called Parmesan knives. They have a strong blade, short handle, and you come and you cut them like this. You cut your wedges and eventually, very often, the cheese is already sort of pre-cut in this way. And you also have this kind of fork, so nobody picks up the cheese with the fork that one's going to later put into one one's mouth, but you pick up these pieces with this fork, you put them on your plate, and then you have your mimolette or your heart cheese. So these two I usually use together. If you don't have these two, you can very well use an oyster knife, for example. It serves the same purpose as this one. I'm, I'm talking about hacks if one doesn't have the equipment. And if not, any solid knife that you have. And again, if you don't have this from a cheese set, you can use any spare fork you have. Or if you want to use a fancy fork, you can use your silverware, your cake fork, for example. Fancy, not fancy. Mix and match. Now we've seen the different families, the different ways of cutting the different shapes. I've only got to show you how you taste your cheese. Finally, now we taste our cheese platter. So I've added two extra cheeses here just to show you the different cuts, but I'm still with my odd number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I've served myself some cheese. Remember what I told you? That we went from the milder cheese to the stronger cheese. Here I have two cheeses from the same family. Goat my Valencé and my saint de Touraine. But remember that I told you that they were lighter in shade than cow's or sheep's cheese? You see it here. But when I cut them, I see that my Valencé is whiter than my saint de Touraine. This means that this one is riper. I did it on purpose to show you. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put my lighter cheese first, then I'm going to put my riper cheese, and then I'm going to go around with the other families. Except that here I have another trick. I told you that cooked pressed cheese was taken before uncooked pressed cheese, except that here I got an aged Conte. This one is going to be stronger than this one because this one has aged quite a lot, this one hasn't. And you see it in the color. This one is darker than this one. So in this case, I'm going to change my cheese and I'm going to put it in this way. A bit to what I told you today between five and six. There are some times when you have to adapt to the cheese you have in front of you. Then this is my Munster, this is my Bloomy Rind, and this is my Roquefort. So now I have one, one, two, four, three, five, six. And what do the French take with cheese? Normally bread, simple bread. Some people enjoy gingerbread with Roquefort, 
Many people simply take traditional baguette, or if not, whole bread, either plain whole bread or with grains. You can also put fruit, nuts, raisins, but normally I prefer to go for rather plain breads to taste my cheese. Now, I don't have any more space on my counter. Some people take some jellies, for example, black cherry. People in Pays Basque really enjoy it with their osawi reati. Another favorite may be fig or honey that isn't too sweet. I haven't put them here just to have the space to show you the different cheeses. Of course, you can decorate it in a different way. To drink, it's a very open question. Some people enjoy dry white wines. Some people enjoy sweet white wines. Some people prefer red wine. Others might want to take cider or beer. It really depends. For example, some people are going to take beer with their Munster. Remember I told you that washed rinds used to be washed with beer, it could be a possibility. Some people in Normandy are going to take their camembert with cider. Cider is from Normandy in France. And some people are going to match this and this together. Other people like a sweet wine with their Roquefort. Montbazillac, Sainte Croix du Mont. I've just put some different wines here. The main idea is that you don't really want to choose a specific wine for a specific cheese. Go with your wine, have a white wine eventually for your cheese because many people enjoy white wine with cheese and eventually you may start with a sweet wine if you want for your cheese and then continue with your sweet wine for your dessert. That's another favorite. I hope these tips have helped you in your planning of your French cheese board this Christmas. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I wish you all an extremely and very, 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 very happy Christmas. Merry Christmas to you all.